All right, so let's finish up our lecture on chapter 19. We took the assignment out there already just a few minutes ago. All right, so <clears throat> if you recall, um, when we ended our lecture last Monday, we are talking about earnings per share, uh, the basic computation for earnings per share, simply is net income over uh, the, the numerator and the denominator is the number of shares outstanding. The only catch is when you have uh, shares that are sold um, or bought during the year, then you have to deal with that. We talked about uh, shares being sold during the year, you have to use the weighted average number of common shares outstanding in that case. But if, if the shares have been outstanding all year, it's just whatever those shares are as your denominator. <clears throat> so here, you've got a basic uh, EPS. And then we looked at this uh, example where on March 1, uh, an additional 12 million shares are sold. Well, in this case, you've got uh, to, you've got shares that were outstanding for 10 months out of the year. So you take and multiply 12 million shares times 10 twelfths, and add that number, which is 10, the weighted average, to the 60 that are outstanding all year. Now, stock dividends and stock splits. This is where we pick up the new stuff. <clears throat> and so this stock dividends and stock splits is where you have additional shares distributed to the existing shareholders. And these additional shares don't really add value, it, it's just creating more shares. So as I indicated um, last week, what you're doing is just, you've got uh, a large pizza, okay? And let's say before you had eight pieces of pizza and you turn around and cut the pizza again to have 16 uh, pieces of pizza. It doesn't mean you have more pizza. It just means you've you've got more uh, slices, but it's the same amount of pizza as before. Well, the same goes here, and so it does, however, change how we calculate EPS. So here we have an example of a 10% stock dividend issued on June 17th. And so for this, what you're going to do is you're going to multiply the outstanding shares during the period times the additional 10%, which is 1.10. Okay, and, and notice it's as if this stock dividend occurred at the beginning of the year for uh, both groups of, of stock here. We don't have any sort of weighted average for this stock dividend adjustment. It goes back to the beginning of the year, and for the additional shares of stock, it begins 
of course, on March 1st. So here, you've increased the number of shares by 11. Now what happens when you reacquire shares, whether you are uh, retiring those shares or just bringing them back as treasury shares? And so here, the weighted number average, uh, the weighted average number of shares is reduced. And as it says in the book, the number of reacquired shares is time-weighted for the fraction of the year that they were not outstanding prior to being subtracted from the number of shares outstanding during the period. Now, when a stock distribution occurs during the the reporting penny period, any sales or purchases of shares that occur before but not after the distribution are increased by the distribution. So here we have an example. You've got, along with everything else we've been talking about, uh, on October 1, 8 million shares were reacquired as treasury stock. So here, you've got your other things that we talked about previously. The stock dividend of 10%, the uh, sale of 12 million shares on March 1st, and of course, the 60 million outstanding the whole year. We add to that, or actually subtract uh, the 8 million shares that are reacquired as treasury stock in this example. And so because these 8 million shares are reacquired for three months out of the year, we are weighted averaging those for three twelfths. So 8 million shares divided by three twelfths or one fourth, which is a total of two, is subtracted from the number of shares outstanding during the year. <clears throat> now, when uh, looking at the denominator, or excuse me, the numerator, when you have a senior class of shareholders, such as preferred shareholders, these shareholders are entitled to a specified allocation of earnings, such as preferred dividends. And these amounts are subtracted from earnings before calculating earnings per share. And so we subtract dividends on cumulative preferred stock, even if not declared in a particular period, because the presumption is that they're going to have to be paid eventually. And so here we have an example of that, along with everything else uh, we've talked about previously. We've got <clears throat> preferred stock that's non-convertible meaning it's not convert, convertible to common stock. And so it's uh, 5 million shares at 8%, $10 par, and it's outstanding the whole year. And so that's... 5 million times 8%, that's $4 million 
eight, that's 8% 8 times $10 par times 5 million shares. So the preferred dividends that accumulate, whether or not there uh, is, a, is a dividend that is announced to be paid in a distribution by the board, it still has to be subtracted from basic EPS, the numerator, because the, again, the assumption is it's got to be paid eventually. All right, so that's it for basic earnings per share. Certain items can dilute earnings per share. If they are turned into common shares, and so these are potential common shares, these are securities that are not common stock but might become common stock through uh, their exercise or conversion. And so where you have this situation, you have potential common shares, you have what's called a ca complex capital structure because you have these potential shares that are outstanding. And so examples of potential common shares are convertible bonds, convertible preferred stock, as we've seen, stock options, and contingently issuable securities, such as convertible bonds, or excuse me, like convertible, uh, well, securities, yeah. All right, so a firm with a complex uh, capital structure reports not only basic EPS, but they also uh, calculate diluted EPS, which incorporates the dilutive effect of all potential common shares. <clears throat> so let's look at some of those and see how they're handled. So here we have options, rights, and warrants. These give the holders the right to exercise their option to purchase common stock at a specified price, as we saw in the beginning of the chapter. And so the dilution results from the possible exercise and should be reflected in the calculation of diluted EPS, but not basic EPS. So what that means it, uh, to include the dilutive effect of a, a security means to calculate EPS as if the potential increase in shares already has occurred. So we assume it's happened. So the assumptions are that the options were exercised at the beginning of the reporting period or when the options were issued, if that's a later date. We also assume that cash proceeds from selling the new shares at the exercise price are used to buy buy back as many shares as possible at the shares average market price. And so the difference is what we consider because the options that are, that are assumed to exercise, exercised are going to increase the number of shares, but the fact that we're taking those proceeds and buying back shares out in the market reduces that amount, as we will see. And so here's an example of that. We've got uh, the same basic example, reporting net income of 154 million. Um, you know, everything we've talked about up to now, 
with the uh, 60 million common shares outstanding, 12 million new shares, 10% stock dividend, and the 8 million shares reacquired as treasury stock. And on top of that, we have the average market price of a common share at $25 per share. And we have preferred stock non-convertible at 5 million shares and then we have incentive stock options granted in 2013 to executives that are exercisable after 2017 for 15 million common shares at an exercise price of $20 per share. Okay, and so the assumption is that in 2018, since the stock options are now exercisable, the assumption is that they are exercised, so we have to add those 15 million common shares in our diluted EPS to our denominator. But we also assume that we're taking the 15 million uh, shares and we're getting $20 per share, so that's $30 million excuse me, $300 million. And we're turning around and we're buying shares out in the open market at $25 per share. Well, 300 million divided by 25 means we're, uh, we're purchasing out in the open market 12 million shares. And you can look at uh, illustration 19-10 for the example here in the book. And so it's the difference between the 15 million we assume are issued and the 12 million we assume we're buying back in the open market. So uh, we're adding the difference, which is three to the denominator in our calculation of diluted EPS. And so it reduces our EPS by one dollar to one dollar ninety two cents. Um, so it shows the diluted effect of these assumed uh, issued shares less the amount that we buy back in the open market. All right, next we want to look at convertible securities. These are securities that can be converted into shares of stock at the option of the holder of the security. And so they are obviously potentially diluted. The potentially diluted effect of convertible securities is reflected in the diluted EPS calculations by pretending they are converted, just like we saw with options, rights, and warrants. So when we pretend they are converted, the denominator of the EPS fraction is increased by the additional uh, common shares that would have been issued upon conversion. The numerator is increased by the after-tax interest on bonds or other debt or the preferred dividends that would have been avoided if the securities had been, not been outstanding due to having been converted. So here we have an example of that. Again, our running example. So here we have 
Uh, on top of everything else, we have 10%, $300 million face amount in convertible bonds issued in 2017, convertible into $12 million of common shares. And so we're going to add the 12 million shares to our diluted ETS, but we have to consider the after-tax effect of not paying interest on these bonds if they've been, if we are assuming they're converted to $12 million common share, then we have to assume also that we're, we're uh, not paying interest on the bonds. And so we have to consider the after-tax effect of that. Okay, so here we, uh, in the denominator, the easy part is adding the $12 million, uh, or excuse me, 12 million shares of uh, common stock And then here's the, the more complicated matter, the fact that uh, the interest we're paying is 30 million, which is 300 million times 10%, but the after-tax interest savings is only uh, 18 million because uh, 12 million which is 40% tax rate times the 30 million is after tax interest interest savings. So the total after tax effect is $18 million, which is 30 million minus 12 million. For convertible preferred stock, same same idea. EPS is calculated as if the conversion already had occurred. The effect of the EPS calculation is that shares are added to the denominator. But uh, as you recall, we had a, a four million dollar dividend that was subtracted from net income uh, available to shareholders. In this case you don't subtract them. If you're assuming that the shares are added to the denominator, that you're acting as if they're, the conversion already occurred, then in that case, the, the corporation's not going to be obligated to pay a, a preferred dividend. So you don't subtract it. So you add the three in this case, you've got uh, in this example, you've got preferred stock convertible into three million common shares. And so you're going to add that to your denominator, but you're also going to not subtract the preferred dividends. If you have what are called anti-diluted securities, you're going to ignore these when calculating both basic and diluted earnings per share. How do you know something's anti-dilutive? It's anti-dilutive if the conversion or exercise of the potential common shares would increase rather than decrease earnings per share. So examples would be such things as options, warrants, and rights. When the buyback price is higher 
than the exercise price. Trying to think about this for a second. So really, that's all I want to say about that, but here's an ex example. So you've got the same sort of situation going on, um, but here you've got stock warrants granted in 2017 exercisable for 4 million common shares at an exercise price of 32.50 per share. Well, in that case, if you recall, the uh, average market price for common shares during 18 was $25 per share. And so the market price is below the exercise price. Think about that for a minute. Who would exercise these stock warrants at $32.50 when they could go out on the open market and buy the stock for a lower price? Well, you wouldn't. And so in this case, uh, this situation where, uh, our, you know, think about this. If somebody was dumb enough to exercise 4 million common shares at 3250, again, we, we assume that uh, these shares are exercised or this uh, warrants are exercised and the company could actually go out on the open market and purchase uh, more shares than the 4 million because they're only uh, paying $25 per share. So in that case, uh, they would bring in, back in more shares than their, uh, the, the 4 million that, that go out on this uh, stock one. So actually earnings uh, per share would increase, not decrease. So that's where it has an anti-dilutive uh, effect uh, EPS increases rather than decreases. So anytime you have that situation going on, you just ignore the anti-dilutive anti stuff. So really, that's about all I want to discuss in Chapter 19. Um, I will, or I, like I said, I already put out a, uh, an assignment and quiz for Chapter 19. Um, I will um, also have a lecture for Chapter 20 next week about this time. And I'll also put out an assignment for Chapter 20 uh, next Monday about this time as well.